sure Dr. Cowles will cover it all well and they'll, they'll be up to speed. So thank you for coming. If, uh, let's see, we have one new face here, I think. Uh, uh, you're not new, are you? Oh, you're, uh, we have two new faces, good. <clears throat> well, to the new faces, the facilities are down the hall on the right-hand side, and anything that I can do to help you, please let me know. My name's Glenn Marshall, and uh, you've come to, to hear about heart disease. Yeah, number one killer. Is it still the number one killer in America? Still is the number one killer in America, and uh, I don't believe any of us want to go that route. So thank you for coming, and I believe you're going to find some information today that will truly change your life as it has mine. Uh, let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the privilege we have of, of cooperating with you and following your basic principles uh, of health. Lord, we know that you created us, and you can recreate us, and uh, you can keep us healthy, you can heal us. So, so Father, we want to cooperate with you and partners, in partnership with you uh, that our health might be pleasing to, to you, and we just want to give you the praise and glory ahead of time. Thank you for being with us, be with those that are still coming, and pray that you'll give Dr. Collins just the words that we need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. Thank you. If you can't see or want to see better, you're definitely welcome to come closer. Uh, that way I can hear you when you have questions. Of course, we have a microphone. And that. What we were planning to do is I'll speak for an hour or so, and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, either questions on the topic of today or if you have another uh, question I'll do my best to answer. The goal of today is not to convince you how bad heart disease is. The goal of today is to convince that you can do something about it. Most people look at disease as something that they get diagnosed with and then they have to go to some professional to get treated and hopefully the treatment works. Well, if the treatment that most of the professionals right now are offering worked, then I wouldn't be here. And neither would you, because it would have worked. The truth of the matter is that, how long have we been fighting heart disease? Then why is it still heart and vascular, so heart and stroke are our biggies, why is cardiovascular disease still our major killer if we've been fighting it for 50 years? It's a good question, I think. The numbers are total are improving. In other words, we have a lower number and we've had a larger population, so we are making some progress, but we're not making anywhere near the progress. And the most of the progress that we're making is we're teaching you how to take drugs better, that are more powerful, that can sustain life without sustaining a good form of mental health or a good form of physical health and robbing your bank accounts. I was director of cardiac and pulmonary rehab at the hospital that I worked close to and it wasn't unusual for a person's medication bill to be 800 to 1000 dollars a month. Uh, that, that's ridiculous. That's what you should plan to have a house for, not a few pills you swallow. Prescriptions costing over 200 dollars. I am not sure, I guess as long as my mind works, I will keep working. But my point is, I have found a new challenge and I'm doing research on it now, and the challenge is dementia. And I see it in younger and younger people. I have people 20 years younger than me sitting in my office, and they're trying to explain something, and you watch their brain shifting gears and trying to do everything to try to figure out what they're talking about, and they use words like, you know, that, 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 that widget gidget that I'm talking about. Well, I don't know what widget gidget they're talking about, or they're trying to tell me what their diagnosis is, and I, want to try, I have to guess for them what their diagnosis is from what I've already deduced already. And I'm going, this is not fair. This is not 
80 years old and someone gets forgetful. So we are seeing major shifts in brain cognitive function. Anyway, that's my new challenge. And the reason I'm sharing that is if there was nothing we could do about it, then I wouldn't waste your time. But over the 200 plus drugs that have been used and tried and experimented on over the past 20 years, it's about zero success. But the research that's coming out now is showing that they have clinics now for people with dementia, with Alzheimer's, a certain form of dementia, that's very successful. So that's, maybe we'll have to talk about that some other time. Our topic for today is heart, but I'm gonna tell you that what I'm gonna share with you about your heart will take care of your brain, how's that? Because any health program is different than medicine because you don't take care of your brain by doing this, and if you use this medication to take care of your brain, it automatically gives you high blood pressure. And so you take a high blood pressure pill, which helps you shrink your brain, and then we're both in trouble. What do you think all these statin drugs have done for dementia? Remember, your brain has the, one of the highest concentrations of cholesterol. That's why we recommend you don't eat them. It has one of the highest concentrations of cholesterol. If I change the cholesterol metabolism in your body, I get a better number in the bloodstream and give you dementia. How do you like the trade-off? Oh, your numbers look good. And the dear man sits there and says, well, what are numbers? You see my point. Medicine has futile efforts because we get very tunneled vision. Well, I'm not here to preach about medicine one way or the other, but... Um, after 40 years, actually it's more than 40 years now in practice, uh, you, you, you get to learn a few things. So I'm gonna share with what you have learned. Some of you have heard my story before, and then we're gonna make it more specific. So I may be going rapidly through some of it that you've seen before. I'm not trying to bore you. I'm trying to give a complete picture. And some of you have been here and have been to some of the lectures and not the others. Some of you have been through uh, this lecture already that we've had before, either last year or the year before. The reason I start with this slide is because if we don't understand this, I don't care how good your coronary arteries are, the consciousness of right doing is the best medicine for diseased bodies. I meet so many people that believe that something they're doing is hurting themselves or they're willing to admit that what I'm doing is hurting themselves and so they know they're not doing the right thing. Well, you go, well, you're telling me that if I eat a cheeseburger and I know it's not healthy for my heart, that I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah, I'm telling you you're doing the wrong thing, but I'm not telling you it's just a block up the coronary artery. I'm telling you that you don't understand that when you do something to your brain that you know is not healthy, it affects your brain as well as your coronary arteries. That's what you should get from this slide. Now, most of you, and I will include myself in this, you know better than what you're doing. Is that not true? So the reason we use knowledge is because we always have to have a vehicle to communicate. But the bigger vehicle to communicate this afternoon, and that's my goal, is how do I motivate you to believe that you can be successful by being healthy? You know, you see the picture in the magazine, lose 14 pounds in 14 days. You go, that's crazy. The next time the paper comes out, you see the same ad, 14 pounds in 14 days. And you go, well, good for them. Then you see the paper the next week comes out, 14 pounds in 14 days, and you go, well, maybe. And by the fifth time you hit it, you go, it might work. They say it takes seven times. So I'm not sure where you're at in this seven, but I'm hoping you're somewhere, and I can push you one step further saying, number one, it's worth it. Number two, I don't have to live to eat. That's not my goal in life. There are so many things that I enjoy that I can find pleasure in other things. Food just happens to be an American pastime. We're not eating because we're hungry anymore. We're eating for entertainment. Well, my story starts in World War I, as you've seen before, so I'm gonna go through this quickly. The mass experiment for becoming a vegetarian happens in some unexpected times. World War I in Denmark, Heinhild's plan, Dr. McKell, very novel plan, 
and any of you would be recommending this now. You stop feeding these major consumers called animals and then you eat the animal because that transition is about one-tenth the product. So if you're short on food supply, you eat it yourself and beat the cow to it, okay? Basic logic. If you have a limited food supply, you don't eat animals because animals are not efficient ways to produce food for a population. Now, Americans have a hard time understanding that because we have millions of acres of farmland. We grow more corn and more soybeans than every one of us if we ate tofu every day can eat, okay? We have bounty, we have vast lands. Now if you're in a small country and have minimal resources like this country here, this is why. Stop feeding the nation's grain to livestock and feed the grain to the people. But I want to show you what happened. And these people weren't trying to be vegetarian. The death rate decreased between October 1917 and 19 during the wartime, it dropped 34% in one year. What would that happen if that happened in North Carolina? The first thing is, you'd put a lot of people out of business. Maybe put me out of business, that'd be fine. You would take one third of your hospitals would be empty. They wouldn't be building newer ones or looking for some more diagnostic technique. You wouldn't be watching the ads on the television for a new drug. You go, I don't care about your drugs. I'm doing better. Our population is doing better. We're healthy. What are you doing? Did you see the reference down here? Journal of the American Medical Association, 1920. See that journal it used to have some really good stuff in it. Why do I show you that? That's almost a hundred years ago. We had this information a hundred years ago. How many times did your doctor walk in the office and show you this? I don't want to give you any medication today. What I want you to do is to eat cabbage. And you look at them and going, what kind of quack did I come to? <laughs> and I, have, I actually treat doctors too. They come to me and they share their frustration because a patient's come to them and if the if the patient doesn't receive the medication they think they deserve from that doctor, and by the way, most doctors work for hospital chains, they go to people above him and report him that the doctor didn't give the medication that they thought they should have. And since you're trying to please a population, what do you do? The doctor's in trouble. World War II, Norway here, German invasion, Here's what happened to their death rates. Once again, when the Germans came through, as troops will, they want your beef, they want your steak, they want your dairy, they want your cheese, they want your nice white bread, your loaves, everything. What was left for the citizens was pretty much vegetarian. Pretty much what they could get. Their whole grains are rather crude or high fiber. But look what happened at the bottom here. Their fat consumption went from 17 kilograms per year, that would be about 37 pounds, down to less than 10 over that six year period. And you go, well that's great, they, they decrease their fat intake. I do that too, I eat all these low fat foods. Well, all these low fat foods in America have done what? Have you noticed the incidence of us getting heavier the more low fat foods we're eating? Well, we should ask some, Folks, we should be asking questions. What is the stupidity that's going on around me? Because if you're telling me that if I eat low-fat foods, I lose weight, then you show me who does that. I don't find it to be true. As a general population, I don't find it to be true at all. The death rate in the population from circulatory diseases, that would be your heart and stroke we're talking about here today, went from about 31 down to less than 23 in a six year period of time. That means they dropped their death rate by about 30, 35%. And before you say I'm too old for this, we're not gonna let you off the hook yet. The 80 plus year old age group, for 10,000 population, they were losing about 200 people for every 10,000 people in that country. 
it dropped down to 100. That's called a 100% decrease, even in people. Think about it, okay? You've lived in Norway all your life. You had, you're invaded by foreign troops. You may have gotten kicked out of your family home because someone else wanted to sleep in your bed and you're put out. You have limited food supply. You can't even cook your food. You're basically become a nomad. So they were stressed out. They had lost everything they'd worked for their whole life. And yet you think, well, wow, that's enough to kill anybody. Well, their death rate dropped in half. The 60 to 79 year old age group went from 25 down to five, a 500% reduction in death rate. And the younger group, 40 to 59, peaked at about 1.2 and it dropped down to 0.1, about a 1200% decrease. Now, you wanna, know, you wanna hear the bad news? What happened after the war? When are we going to learn? Because many people will come to me, they will put in their time, they will do better, and I'm thankful for that. But then we look at health as a treatment, not health as my life. So I don't want you to look at health as a treatment for a disease. I want you to look at health as a way of living. You don't get to quit being healthy when your ulcers go away. You don't get to quit being healthy when you get down to your optimum weight. You don't get to quit being healthy when you blood pressure returns to normal. Are you seeing my point? Health is not a treatment like a prescription drug. Health is the way that you think. And until it gets in here and you start thinking like that, then guess what? You're going to fight it all the way. You're going to gain three pounds and lose three pounds. It's a mental thing. Remember I said, the consciousness of right doing is the best medicine. It has to start in your head. So why worry about cardiovascular disease? Cardiovascular disease is our number one killer. When we, remember when we say cardiovascular, we mean heart plus stroke, that's the biggies, plus other vascular issues. Now when you take cardiac MIs, heart attacks, by themselves, Cancer is outrunning it, you'll see that. But when you put this together, this is still our number one. So when you look at the pie, we see cardiovascular disease, 35.7. We see cancer at 22.9. We've got respiratory at five, injuries, diabetes, influenza, Alzheimer's, kidney, and septicemia. Cardiovascular continues to be, continues to strike young as well as middle-aged individuals. We are losing ground on several important risk factors and the demographics are changing. We are having an aging population and when you have an aging population, you expect to have more illness. Well, they call it the baby boomers, which uh, probably half or more of you in the room are considered baby boomers. Were you born between 1946 and 1960? Six, somewhere in that, some, somewhere in that zone. That, that's about the, the stretch, somewhere in there. If you, you qualify for being a baby boomer, okay? The rate of baby boomers retiring at this point is a phenomenal number and it's overloading the system because we had this large population that's coming through. We have a school in our area that is closed and you'll find that elementary schools are closing and the reason they're closing is because we're having less children living in that area at younger age. So we have an aging population. In 1900, first of all, the, the blue category, well, let's go up here, population age 65 and older. So the blue is 65 to 74, the light green 75 to 84, and the dark green 85 plus. So let's go to uh, 1900. We almost didn't have, or it's not even detected, an 85 plus group. And as we go along here, by, eight, by 1950, we had 8.4 above 65 to 74, 3.3 and 12. See what's happening here. The above 65 to 74 has continued to increase. The group between 75 and 84 has continued to increase, and the 85 plus is increasing. 
So we're seeing an aging of the population. So we're going to see more age-related diseases. It's not a requirement that you get old and die. Whatever happened to dying from old age? In other words, you don't have to have a diagnosis. You go to sleep at night and you don't wake up in the morning. Not with 18 tubes and a ventilator stuck in you. By the way, you realize that half of your medical expenditure for your whole life is spent in the last two weeks of life. Let me say that again. We spend 50% of our total health care budget in the last two weeks of life. And tell me, how much quality did you get for all that money? There's no place you'd rather not be than where you are at that time usually, which means stuck in a hospital and one more test to get done. Now let's be fair. If we knew exactly who was only going to survive for two weeks, then we would have a very important tip. Because we don't know, and an intervention here, the person may live another three to five years. We don't know who is only going to live two more weeks. I will admit that. But what it should tell us is that we're doing far too many heroic efforts way too late in life and it's costing us big dollars and it's actually damaging the health care for people who are younger because of the high price tag and because of availability. Adult smoking, obviously smoking is on the decline. One of the major factors that decreases the health of your vessel wall. It's known as a major toxin. You breathe it in, affects your lung. Obviously, but I want you to look at a few things. When did it decrease? Back in, back in 1920, 1930, during the Great Depression, there was a decrease in smoking. Why do you think? When you're broke, hopefully you're going to let this one go. We thought when we went to 6 or $7 a pack, it would cut people from smoking. And by the way, it did. I was in Canada during that period of time when they kept raising the price of cigarettes, and it definitely cut back. As we go along our chart here, we see World War II. We see the first smoking cancer concern back in the 60s. Here's the Surgeon General's report, and you come on down, the first, said, the first great American smoke out, and you come along, um, the nicotine medications available over the counter, and then they come on down here, and we're decreasing over the years. The problem is this right here. From the Youth Behavior Survey, every, the youth from 9th through 12th grade, the percent of youth that are smoking goes up. We're getting new smokers. Are we living longer? From 2016, we don't have the present data coming out for 2019 yet, but 2016 to 17, 17 to 18, we're seeing a decrease every year in population expectancy. So to answer your question, if the trend continues, we're not living longer. Not only are we not living longer, we're much more diseased. Why do you think there's a neonatal specialty? You can be a pediatrician and you go on to being a pediatrician who deals with what? You're sick when you're born. Some kids don't even get a chance. Now if you start out your life with a month in the hospital, how do you expect it to get better? We're doing something wrong. Women are not immune to heart disease. Sometimes you may think so. And it is true the rate for heart disease for ladies is less than for men. Look at this chart, cardiovascular disease for men and for women, so men still outrank the women, respiratory cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer for men versus women. But women, you'll hear this, heart disease is still the number one killer for women too. So we've got a good mixed group here. Potential for falling longevity. On one hand, we have health adverse behavior is balanced with public health measures and life extending technology. Since about 1980, the lifespan for a male in America at 50 years of age and older has almost not gone up at all. 
we've gotten better at saving some babies. But the life expectancy, once you have reached, once you reach age 50, has basically changed very little. So what is cardiovascular disease? Reverse to disease involving the heart and blood vessels. We'll be spending our time on that. The heart, various terminology, angina, is the definition of lack of blood flow of the heart muscle. And the heart muscle, because it's got a nerve in it, is going to start hollering at you. If you want a classic example, get your blood pressure cuff, pump it up, and leave it on for five minutes. Now, I don't advise this every day, okay? I'm just trying to make a point. You will start to feel in your forearm muscle what your heart muscle feels. That's, that's angina, or angina, however you want to say that. Heart attacks, heart failure, and arrhythmias. In the brain area, we call it strokes, lack of blood flow to a certain area, a TIA, transient ischemic attack. In the peripheral, we have claudication, ulceration, and unfortunately, amputation. We see this a lot in vascular problems, mostly involving diabetes. But you can get a blockage in any artery, in any part of the body, whether it's your carotids, your coronaries, uh, your femorals, all the way through your body. So it's a broad definition. Now for a little bit of humor. It's too serious. Which weighs more, five pounds of fat or five pounds of muscle? Thank you. They weigh the same. Obviously, it's five pounds, folks. The reason people say that is why. Because look how much space this takes up versus this. So when you see a person step on a scale and they weigh more than what you think they do, it's probably it's because they carry more lean muscle because it takes up less space. Oh, on the other hand, I have people come in the office and say, you know, you won't believe it. I've been on your program for a month. I've lost two inches around the waist. I stepped on the scale and I only lost one pound. I go, that's great. And they look at me like, what's wrong with you? I go, you lost four pounds of fat. You gained three pounds of muscle and the scale doesn't know anything about that. How do you expect the scale to know what you did all month? Because when you lose inches, that's the key to basically getting back to where you belong. So, I want you to have more of this and less of this. Now, with all the advice that's been given by the American Heart Association, by the National Cholesterol Education Program, guess what they're still recommending? They're still recommending that you eat fish and chicken. They are still recommending that you eat some cholesterol. They are still recommending that you should have saturated fat. And here's the results. The standard heart disease diet recommends 26% of what you eat should come from fat. They recommend that 250 milligrams of cholesterol, which is about one egg a day, but they will recommend three eggs a week and then you have your other cholesterol things, your cheese, your milk, whatever. Why would any organization recommend what gives you heart disease if they claim to be the Heart Association? Have you ever thought about that one? It's frustrating because I wonder who they're working for. So when they knock on my door and they say, we're inventing new drugs, we're inventing new procedures to help you with heart disease, I'm going, you don't need any new procedures. In fact, you don't need any new drugs. In fact, if you want to wait a minute, I'll tell you how to take care of your heart. Had a good time with a man that came to my house. He wanted to sell me a cancer policy. Nice young man, so we had a good talk. And hopefully I helped him more than he helped me before we were done with our conversation. I go, why should I buy your policy? Well, if you get cancer, I go, well, wait a minute. You're missing the point. I'm not planning on getting cancer, number one. Number two, why don't you sell what I'm selling? Why don't you help people to get so healthy that they don't need your policy. Well, obviously that was the end of the sales routine. <laughs> After four years of being on this program, okay, four years is usually enough to have good regression of artery disease. And when I say good, you don't hurt, you can climb a hill, you're much more active, et cetera, et cetera. After four years, there was a decrease in the total cholesterol. This is a blood test, obviously. 
but there was also a decrease of 6% in the total and 6% in the LDL. So really we're bragging here because it means it's a 6% loss in the bad guy and that made a 6% loss in the total. So we're saying the same thing twice here. And geography results, we had 6% of the whole group that had regression, which means the plaque got a little smaller. We had 15% no change and we had almost 80% that continued to block up four years on the program. Medicine expects the opposite. If I'm not 80% successful in what I'm telling you to do, then I need to be out of business. In other words, the American Heart Association should be out of business. They have an 80% failure rate. That you should never listen to them again, and you should go, I don't know what you're doing. Because if you did that in any other type of business, what would happen to you? If 80% of your customers return their goods, will you be in business very long? No. Why do we tolerate it in this situation? Medicine really gets off the hook. Some of you smile at me because you're talking about, well, I had this procedure and I did this and this and this and this and it didn't work. I said, well, did you ask for your money back? When have you ever asked for your money back when you go to your dentist and your tooth hurts again in a year? Do you go there and ask for your money back? Here's a sidelight, an enjoyable trip for you too. The dentist that I go to in Costa Rica believes in a money back guarantee. For your life, if one of my implants fail, I can go back to him, hasn't paid for my trip yet, I have to admit that, but I can go back to him and he will take care of me for the rest of my life. That's why I call someone that believes in what they're doing. And that's what I believe. No, I'm not a dentist. But what I'm telling you today, if you will follow, you're going to need less medication. You're going to need less doctoring. You're going to have your marbles, hopefully until you don't need them anymore, etc., etc. Research, a different project, same basic goals, this is unique, let me, let me fill in the story. This was a surgical intervention to lower cholesterol. Now this isn't the surgical group, this is the control group. The other people that were on the opposite, they were getting surgeries to try to lower cholesterol. Can you imagine someone being willing to get cut open to deal with lowering their cholesterol? Well this was the control group, and so this was the diet group versus the surgical group. So I'm looking at the diet group. I don't recommend the, forget about the surgical group. That wasn't even good. And you probably have never heard of it and it's good. 250, excuse me, 25 milligram, 25 percent fat, 200 to 250 milligrams of cholesterol. Almost identical to the American Heart Association diet. Let's see what they got. After three years, 41 percent of the group had progression. Remember the other slide, four years, 79%. After five years, 65% had progression, getting more blocked up. After seven years, 77%. And after 10 years, 85%. I consider that a failure. Now, what's the excuse? Because I talked, and they go, we don't believe that people will make the changes they need if you get too radical, Collins. I go, that may be true, but I can't stand up here and tell you to do a half-baked, poor job and expect you to listen to me. Now, if you don't want to do this, that is your privilege, obviously, but I find people who want to do this, and if I gave them this information and I knew what the outcome was, then they should fire me, or at least take me out back and tar and feather me like they used to do. This is, it just doesn't make sense. That's why I have no respect for the American Cancer Society and no respect for the American Diabetic Association. You go through all, the, all these groups that ask you for money are promoting disease because they believe that you're not willing to change. And I'm going, no, I'm not willing to accept that because everywhere I go, there's at least that one person who grabs the quote bull by the horns and says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go for it. This is worth it. Dr. Dean Ornish said it's worth it. 
with the lifestyle heart trial, intervention trial, here's what he got. One year, folks, not 10 years, not four years, one year. By the way, he is a physician in San Francisco, uh, an internist, and he believed that he could reverse heart disease, which was rather poo-pooed when I was in school. You can't reverse plaque. That's when Nathan Pritikin came to my school and showed his people that we're reversing plaque. You go, well, there's something to be said here. Dean Arnish came in the 80s. I was in school in the 70s, so this is a little bit later on. He used PET scans to evaluate his people, so he wouldn't have to do angiograms. Angiograms have a certain amount of, well, percentage of death rate when you get them done, so we don't like to inflict or take a risk on killing you to try to show you that you're not healthy. That really, you know, it's easier ways to do that. He used a PET scan, external, obviously he can evaluate the coronary arteries that way. That's what this man did. But here's what he did. The people that he got were the people who couldn't make it through surgery. The thoracic surgeons were scared that they wouldn't make it through the procedure. So they were telling the people, do the best you can. Oh, by the way, there's this guy named Ornish around the corner here. He may have some ideas for you. I don't think they're worth much, but you may want to try them. So in these kind of experiments, you get people who, number one, are desperate. Number two, they're not fitting the medical protocol, and the surgeons don't take a risk to open them up to even give them a bypass. That's the kind of people he got. Okay, after one year, they had a 24% reduction in the total cholesterol. Show me one drug that does that. They had a 37% decrease in the LDL cholesterol. Now I'll tell you something, a statin drug will lower your LDL cholesterol, but it won't change the heart attack rate of the individual. Let me say that again. We can make your lab work look better, but we don't decrease your heart attack rate. So why in the world am I giving statin drugs? Well, I don't. And hopefully you're not taking one. Hopefully you're willing to change your life. So we have found out that statin drugs make our numbers look better. They do not change the death rate. And if they don't give me health over here, I really don't care what my numbers are. Numbers are important to me, but not compared to living and dying, okay? The only way that you drop your instance of heart disease is the way it's done here. And yes, you will have a decrease in your bad cholesterol. If you decrease your bad cholesterol due to drugs, you do not get the benefit. And we Americans believe that if we decrease our blood pressure or if we decrease our cholesterol with drugs, we're healthier. It's not true. You, we've been sold a bill of goods. So, in angiography, after one year, 82% regression in plaque, 82% regression, 14% uh, no change, and 4% was, they actually got worse. So I got a 96% of my people who improved or stayed the same and a 4%. So what does that prove? Why didn't I have 100%? I'm not sure why, but I know that there's no such thing, or very rarely, 100% in anything I do in medicine. All lesions, big, small, halfway between, 2.2% diameter overall regression of atherosclerosis in all lesions. 2% for eating lentils and cabbage for a whole year? See, when I hear someone say that, you know what that tells me? Bad attitude. I'm picking on you, you're right. Because you know why I call it bad attitude? Because it's the wrong attitude. Remember, if you're doing this as a treatment and not for the sake of your health, you will never keep it up. That's the problem. This health thing we're talking about here is not something you do even to get better, even though that's one of the good side effects. The reason you get healthy is because you believe it's the right thing for your body, you're willing to take care of yourself, and guess what? you get some pretty incredible side effects, like getting to keep your brain. Let's go on. The lesions that were significant, 50% blockage or greater, 
had a 5.3 regression, which equated to a 23% increase in blood flow. When I can increase 23% in blood flow through your coronary arteries, that's all I need to have you run a marathon, folks. That is totally phenomenal. One year, how did he do it? Number one, they met three times a week. No, not for a physical exam or check your blood pressure. They may have done that. They met three times a week for exercise, for education, and they also used meditation. That was their program. But I want to tell you about the diet part. They didn't get to go home with recipes. They went home with a stack of Tupperware containers. He fed those people from his chef, from his kitchen. He couldn't take a chance on stopping by Long John Silver's on the way home. In fact, he couldn't even take a chance that they wouldn't understand what it means to be a vegetarian. Well, fish is vegetarian, right? Well, the fish might be, but if you eat it, you're not. Okay, so he didn't want any misunderstanding when he said, you're going to eat my program. This is the program I want you on. He sent them home with their food. That's how you get these results. In one year, he blew a big hole in the medical community, and they still argue with him. Seventh-day Adventist from the Adventist Health Study in California. Here's the kind of data that we find out. We find that men aged 35 and over as a percent of the expected population, heart disease deaths, unfortunately. That's how you get to be on this chart. Total vegetarians, 14% as compared to the general population, which we would set them at 100%. So they had an 86% reduction in their amount of heart disease deaths. The lacto-ovo, milk and eggs eating vegetarians, they don't eat any actual animal, they eat byproducts, 39%. And the non-vegetarian is about 56% of the general population. Now in this group, most of them don't drink and most of them don't smoke. So you got rid of the t some of the biggies for heart disease. And typically they eat more fruits and vegetables than the general population. This is about 50% of the group, this is about 50, and a very small fraction, maybe 1 or 2% in that. Now, when you tell someone you're a vegan, they understand. See, when I was growing up as a vegetarian kid, I was really unique. I mean, really unique. Because they'd look at you like, what's your IQ? You know, or what are you going to do? And then your good friends would call you a cabbage head. And I responded appropriately and called them a porky. So, I mean, you know, you, you have to have a little bit of give and take, you know. I mean, but, but you remember, folks, I don't like what's going on these days. You see, when we had an argument, we settled it without intervention of the law or courts or mama coming out and saying you didn't deserve to have that black eye. That's the way we settled it, and that's where we took care of it when I was that old. So you, you have to make sure that the vegetarian kid, you either have to be able to outrun the porky or beat him up. Well, yeah, I mean, you had to do something. <laughs> now, let's face the fact. The Iron Man who go to Hawaii for the Iron Man race, guess who wins the race? I'll give you a hint. It's not the Porky. <laughs> now, why am I picking on that? I'm trying to make a point. When you eat an animal product, it takes a lot more energy in your body to clean it up, to detoxify, to eliminate, and deal with that. When you are eating a food that we eat takes up more of your vital force and your energy to process, then you're not going to have as much energy to do what you want to. How's that? In the Ironman race, if you aren't a vegan, you might as well stay home because you're not going to win the race because they just don't have the endurance. Now, I don't even want to think about it. I mean, you know what they do. 2.2 miles first thing in the morning. How would you like to roll out of bed and go out in the ocean and swim for 2.2 miles? Then they get out, and they get on their bicycle, and they ride 102 miles. Then they get off their bicycle. By the way, this isn't five days, okay? This is a day. Then they get off 
the bicycle, change their shoes, and run a marathon. 26.2 miles. And they do it all in about nine hours. I don't know. I think some people have different muscle structure, and I can train just as much as they and not win the race. I do believe that. I'm not cut out for that. And that would have to be a full-time career. And when I show you some other slides, they don't have the, long, they don't have the edge on longevity anyway. Benefits from a total vegetarian diet, zero cholesterol. Cholesterol is not found in olives. It's not found in avocados. It's not found in cashews. Cholesterol is only found in animal cells. Animal cells have cholesterol. Oranges, potatoes, they don't have the same kind of cells. They're a different structure. That's why when we say plant-based diet, it's actually a totally different structure of cells versus an animal-based diet. It's not just a matter of, well, they're all the same cells and why, what, what's the big deal? It's low in saturated fat automatically. The exceptions of that rule are both coconut and palm oils. And when I was finishing up my training, we were going with non-dairy this and non-dairy that, and they had non-dairy creamer, and guess what they made it out of? Coconut and palm oil, I'm going, Wow, you tell me that's better than my cow? Very little. Had a patient that came to my office last week, and he says, look at this, look at this. He showed me his lab work. He goes, it was the coconut oil, it was the coconut oil, it got me. I'm going, your lab work looks great. He says, look at it. I've been off the coconut oil for six months and look at my lab work. He says, that's what made it go up. That's what got me. I said, I told you. I didn't say that. No, I told him to go off the coconut oil. If you get benefit from going on coconut oil, your cholesterol is in such bad shape that I'll be glad to help you later on, okay? The point I'm trying to get at is that coconut oil is the highest saturated fat and it will elevate your cholesterol level. It stimulates the liver to produce more cholesterol. Zero animal protein, obviously. Zero heme iron. Hemoglobin, the iron from hemoglobin that's in the animal species is not the iron that you want. I am seeing higher and higher iron levels in my patients. I'm also seeing the laboratory standards continue to shift. I went through college with laboratory medicine, so I've been following these norms. Remember, guess what the norm was when I was in college for cholesterol? You wanna hear this one? 150 to 300, that was normal. You had to be above 300 for the, and then they keep changing the rules on you folks, and now you go to the doctors, and if you're above 200, you're in trouble. Well, guess what? The rules have changed, but people's diets haven't changed that much. Anyway, back to this hemoglobin. I'm seeing higher and higher hemoglobin levels. And what we don't realize is that being anemic is on one side of the coin, but high hemoglobin levels increase your risk of heart disease, of stroke, and other cardiovascular diseases. High hemoglobin is not good. In fact, if you've come and see me, I'd say, please go make a donation to the Red Cross. You know, that's the cheapest way, it will cost you nothing for this intervention and you need to drop your hemoglobin level. You can't run around with these high hemoglobins. You're not a smoker, you don't live in Colorado, you're not a mile high, you don't have a you know, decrease in oxygen to your body. What's going on here? I'm seeing a whole population shift to where now they say hemoglobin of 12, I think people are doing good. Now they have the low end for some males at 14 just to get started and up to seven. You go, wait a minute, what's going on here? If I am seeing a sicker and sicker population, should I continue to change my standards? And the answer is no. Let's admit it. We're sick. Not change the standards. Rich in antioxidants. It's rich in folic acid and B6 and promotes weight control. How many apples can you eat in one day? 10, 20, 30, I dare you. If you eat nothing but apples, you'll find out something very interesting. Yeah, you may get diarrhea. If you eat nothing but apples, you will find out that it automatically has what I call a gag factor. 
You can only eat so much of whole food and you fill up or you say, I've had enough. Therefore, when you eat whole foods, you tend to get to eat more volume, you get more satisfaction, you get higher nutrition, and you get the whole chart up here while you're at it. Nuts reduce heart disease. Nuts have a beneficial effect on cardiovascular diseases, on vessel walls, and that type of thing. But I want to share something with you. If you walk in my office, and I've got some steps to get up to my office, and you tell me that causes you to have chest pain, I'm not going to give you nuts, I'll tell you that right now. Because you can't afford to take a risk on a higher fat content in your bloodstream at that point. Down the road, that can change. So this study is truly prevention. People that eat this way, that are disease-free, have these results. So, relative risk of heart attack. The group that eats nuts less than once per week, we set them equivalent to having a relative risk of one. That's their risk level. If you eat nuts one to four times a week, you have a reduction. So therefore, if you're reducing the heart attack rate, something you're doing must have been helpful. The, uh, we have the non-fatal myocardial infarction heart attack and the darker purple is the fatal one. If we eat nuts five times almost daily, the non-fatals drop to half and the fatal ones drop to about 62% of the total. So yes, nuts can be healthy. How about vegetarian protein? No cholesterol in these two proteins. One protein we use is casein from milk, from cows. The other protein we used is a soy protein. That's the only difference between these two diets. These two groups that you're seeing, we're supposed to exercise, eat a low-fat diet, eat their five fruits and vegetables, etc., etc. The only difference in these two groups was one got a animal protein, milk, dairy, and one got a soy milk, soy vegetable protein. We start off, we set them all at zero. The group that ate the animal protein, the casein, after three weeks of being on the program, their cholesterol dropped about 30 points. Most people would be happy with that. I might even congratulate you, but look at this. The group that were on the vegetable protein, the soy-based diet, their cholesterol dropped about 75 points. There is no drug, there is nothing that is possible to drop your cholesterol 75 points in one week. I'm sorry, three weeks, excuse me. Then we did a crossover, so we find out, do we have some people unique in this group when we're weird, and we, what's going on? So we said, okay, maybe that person would have dropped anyway, so we switched them. So the group that was eating the vegetable protein diet went on the animal protein and their cholesterol went up. The group that were eating the animal protein went on the vegetable protein and it continued to drop. I want to, the reason I show you this slide, we're not talking about cholesterol here, folks. We're talking about what causes the body to produce excessive amount of cholesterol. Now you still haven't asked the question. Well, because I haven't asked you to ask questions. The question you should be asking is saying, wait a minute, what is causing the body to produce cholesterol? And the answer is, there is something that's causing an inflammatory response somewhere in the body, mostly at the tissue level, in the endothelium, in the vessels and the arteries in your body. Your body is more intelligent than you are, if you want to think of it that way. It tells when you produce cholesterol and when you don't need ex extra cholesterol. Your body produces cholesterol for hormones, for nerve function, for brain function, and for protection. Your body will do what it can to protect your heart vessels, even from damage. And if you're in a damaging, inflammatory lifestyle, your body will make more cholesterol to try to protect you. Don't get upset about the cholesterol. Get upset about why you are producing the cholesterol. Here's what we found a secret. We found that animal protein will cause your body to produce cholesterol if there is no cholesterol in the animal protein. There's something about animal protein that causes your liver to be inflamed to put out more cholesterol. Now you know why I'm a plant-based person.
I don't I want less inflammation how about the rabbits rabbits on a plant-based diet rabbits on a I realize we're not rabbits and rabbits shouldn't be eating steak anyway okay but if rabbits were on an animal-based protein, their cholesterol would be two and a half times what it is. The ten plant proteins that cause low cholesterol in rabbits, fava bean happen to be the lowest, pea protein all the way up to rapeseed or canola flour up here as compared to the average animal protein. So therefore, almost any type of vegetable protein is much healthier for you than animal protein. That's a take-home message. On the other hand, we look at animal protein. We start with the average plant protein, and every animal protein, depending on which one, is worse. What comes out is significant, though, because many of you believe that skim milk is healthy for you. I used to tell my patients to go on skim milk because it would cut down their cholesterol then couldn't figure out why I wasn't getting good results. How about turkey, the healthy meat? It's almost up the top. Casein, that's the one we used in our other study. Egg protein, fish protein, beef, chicken, pork. Can you believe that? Pork protein will cause less of a cholesterol response than fish. So, does it start to make sense why people are not getting the results they want from their diets? I see it on a regular basis. Monkeys fed cholesterol. I'm glad it was them, not me, but the point is this is research. Here's the normal artery. Notice the thickness of the wall. Notice the opening in the middle of the lumen and look what happens. So monkeys that were fed cholesterol in their diet and then Different types of fatty acids caused different problems. So, if we add coconut oil to the diet of these monkeys, we get what we call atheromas. We get coronary thrombosis, a clot in your heart artery. We get more stroke, strokes and we get renal artery closure. Your kidneys are the organ that determines your blood pressure. So when the vessels get narrowed that feed the kidneys, you can have high blood pressure and the rest of your vessels in your body be okay. So take care of your kidneys. If you add peanut oil, we get a fibrosis, a fibrous, a scar tissue, adding and making the wall a lot thicker. So the diseases I would see, <clears throat> if my artery wall was thickening, the diseases I would look for would be diseases and tissues that are extremely sensitive to oxygen. For example, degenerative arthritis, how much blood flow do you have going to your cartilage in your knee? Minimal. You, cartilage usually doesn't need a lot of blood flow, but it needs some oxygen to keep the tissue healthy. So if I have lack of oxygen able to get across the wall, then I'm going to see more arthritis. I'm going to see more degenerative disc in the back and essential hypertension. Now, you all know what essential means. you got to have it. No. Essential in medical terms means we don't know. But since we don't like to look like dummies, we, go, we name it things like iatrogenic. That means I really did this to you, but I want it to sound professional. If I call it essential, it means, man, I don't have a clue. But you don't want to go to a doctor that looks at you and says, I don't have a clue. You go, well, why am I here? I don't know. I don't have a clue for that either. So these terms we use to kind of protect uh, ignorance, I guess. So I don't consider hypertension essential or necessary, or there's no such thing as no cause for high blood pressure. Every high blood pressure has a cause. I may not know what it is, but there's definitely a cause. And guess what most of it is? Stress or diet. Have your choice. Maybe you've got both. Fat, milk fat, gives lipid deposits, actually building up in the vessel wall. Here's the scariest slide that I'm going to show you today. It's also the most misunderstood thing today. I wasn't trained in this, so it's new knowledge for me too. I was taught 
that your blood vessels continue to block up over time and we get concerned about the game more narrow and more narrow and they narrow down to I have lack of blood flow and you start having oxygen symptoms. Well, it's my brain, I can't think right or I've got muscles that start to ache because they're not getting blood flow. I've got a problem here. Take a look at this slide with me. This is actual data from the autopsy, okay? Coronary stenosis, blocking up the coronary prior to a myocardial infarction. Do you notice that 68% of all heart attacks are in vessels that are less than 50% blocked up? Now let me talk about flow. If your vessel is 50% open, you have no symptoms, no lack of blood flow, because your body is made to handle that much blood flow easily. Not a problem at all. If your coronary arteries are 50% open, you'll have no angina, you'll have no EKG changes when I put you on the treadmill, you'll have no echocardiograph changes, you will have no medical testable changes unless they do an angiogram and say you got some blockage in there. And we don't want to do those on a routine basis anyway. So 67, excuse me, 68%, two thirds of everybody that has a heart attack has no way of knowing it ahead of time. That's why I say that's the most serious slide that I'm showing you today. So what does it come back to? What I'm preaching, prevent, prevent, prevent. Take pleasure in getting healthy. Take pleasure in taking good care of yourself. Take pleasure in retraining your taste buds because good food can taste good. If you've eaten nothing but Twinkies all your life, then broccoli probably doesn't make it. But it doesn't mean that broccoli doesn't taste good. And if you hate broccoli, then you can eat cauliflower. Stenosis, blockages of 50 to 70%. Now in this category, you probably, very likely, will still pass my treadmill test with no EKG changes have good endurance and no problems. So I don't even catch this group on my treadmill test. There's only one group on this whole thing which happens to be the smallest group, 14% of the people with greater than 70% blockage in the coronary arteries. I catch them on my treadmill. I'm going, you got a definite problem. So treadmill is a great test because I get to watch you exercise. But when it comes down to changing people, by the time I see symptoms, you know what that means. I've got vessels that are very vulnerable, that are very much blocked up. So that is the old theory, the rusty pipe theory, where it keeps corroding, 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 corroding. And then finally at the very end, you may throw a small clot and that block you up. The theory, the accurate theory, the correct theory, is that this is what's happening. And what happens is that let's go along and you get a blood pressure spike it stretches the arterial wall, the plaque that's in the wall cracks, and guess what I've got? I've got a ruptured plaque, I've got a clot on my hands, and I've got a heart attack, and they, most of them happen in less than 50% blocked up. A doctor, a thoracic surgeon, probably won't even put stents in vessels that are less than 50% blocked up. Stents usually put in and ones that are greater. Here's your picture, if you like pictures, okay? Let's explain a little bit. First of all, you're cutting through a vessel. The vessel is shaped like you're cutting this way. What you have here is a clot. That's the red, red blood cells all clotted together. Now, this is on autopsy, okay? But what I want you to notice is what happened here. All this down here was fatty material. This is your cholesterol plaque, fat build up. This is your uh, rupture point. You see where the vessel stretched, tore that, see that one's still intact on that side. This side, you see where it tore open. What happened? I see, all I see is a clot that's migrated past the tear, got down in here, and then blocked off the whole vessel. In general, if I looked at this vessel, an eyeball opinion, this is one of those less than 50%. If you draw the line here, you got this much on top, this much on bottom. This person had less than a 50% blockage. 
that vessel got stretched, the crack, ru I mean, the, uh, the plaque ruptured, and I lost my patient. This is why the patient can get a treadmill test, the doc says you're fine, and two weeks later, he's in the morgue. Yes, it's part the doctor's fault, I will admit that. On the other hand, we need to tell people that our medical testing is only so good and that they don't want to change their life that um, we might see them later. This is an artist conception of blood flow in your capillaries. If you take your eyelid and flip it up and take a special microscope, you can actually see the red blood cells going through. Some of our capillaries are so small, a red blood cell can't make it through without folding up and going through. So here's what happens. Prior to a high fat meal, this is why you want to come in fasting before you have your lab work. Prior to a high fat meal, the blood cells, the white blood cells, red blood cells are moving freely. One hour after a high fat meal, we get some agglutination. They're getting sticky. Four hours after a high fat meal, we've got a lot are getting sticky, they're not able to transfer their oxygen. Well, after six hours, we've got a major problem on our hands. So I'm gonna ask you a question. When do most heart attacks occur? In the early morning hours. Can I ask you what you had for supper? And did I ask you how late you ate? And did I ask you that you were more dehydrated? And, and, and. Here's the amazing thing. This is the gospel according to the blood vessel. Folks, if you messed up once, you got chance. Look what your body does for you. It actually takes the fat out of the bloodstream and stores it, maybe where you don't want it, and stores it and cleans up your blood flow. Now, when you were a kid, when you were 18, you probably did a lot of things you shouldn't have, and I was one of those 18-year-olds too. But what did you always hope for? It doesn't matter how my head feels at midnight, I expect to go to bed and wake up feeling better. Well, is, am I the only 18 year old here? But you see the problem in that logic. What happens when you go to bed and feel like that and you wake up feeling worse? See, because 18 you can get away with about anything. I mean, you can torture your body and get away with about anything. I'm hoping you're not 18 anymore, okay? I hope you don't eat yourself half to death at night and expect to wake up the next morning feeling better. I hope you're not taking advantage of your health anymore that you're trying to protect it and saying, man, I'm losing it. Well, I'm going to confess, I'm not 18 anymore. So I don't even try those kind of stunts for many reasons. What's your risk? We're not going to take time to talk about blood pressure. In general, blood pressure standards are erroneous, meaning that some people say your blood pressure should be 100 plus your age. Well, my mother-in-law's blood pressure should be 196, and I don't think that's a good number. So that's bogus. Oh, your blood pressure is supposed to go up as you get older. That's also bogus. Don't buy into that lie. Well, why do most doctors say that? Because most people that walk in the office, as they get aged, their blood pressure goes up. It's a good conclusion, it's just wrong. I want your blood pressure to be no more than 120 on top and no more than 80 on the bottom. And now I've got people calling me up. My blood pressure is 101 over 64. Am I okay? I'm going, you're awesome. Well, isn't it too low? I say, are you passing out? No, I feel pretty good, awesome. See, we've gotten to a standard where we think 90 over 60 is low pressure. It is not low blood pressure. We have to think it's that way. There are many healthy people at 90 over 60 that have good perfusion to the brain. They can do whatever they want to. When they go to exercise, their pressure goes up. When they go to rest, their pressure goes back down. High blood pressure, obviously affected by diet and our weight. A thin man eating a high fiber diet versus a man eating a low fiber diet versus being overweight. So weight is a factor. There's no doubt about that. And weight is a factor in cardiovascular disease. A stroke continues, the, the risk of a stroke continues to go up as the pressure goes up. 
The same picture I showed you of a vessel that got ruptured, that caused a plaque, that wasn't just a coronary artery. That can be anywhere in your body. Obviously, if it's in your brain, we've got that. The brain is not good at handling high pressure. That's why people get red in the face. That's why people have pulsations. That's why people say, what's going on? I don't feel right. The brain is not made to handle high pressure. It never was. Good perfusion to the brain has to do with flow, not pressure. So the people with low blood pressure can still be getting as good a perfusion to the brain than anyone else. You like my pictures, don't you? It's not modern art, folks. These are carotid arteries. And some pathologists must have liked carotid arteries because I don't know how many get this at once, but he had to collect them, obviously. The group on top are carotid arteries. I want you to know how well they're open, okay? This is what's carrying blood flow to your brain. The amazing thing about your brain is that God gave you four vessels to feed into the base of the brain and you have this one vessel we call the circle of Willis which is actually a circle. You can get blood coming into one part of the circle and how a circle works it can flow around and anywhere it needs. Technically if you have one good open vessel to your brain you should be able to have a good brain. You've got four. So when you have a stroke, we have major problems on hand. These are those arteries. It says occlusion of the brain and the circle of Willis and controls in Alzheimer's disease and in normal people. The top here are open vessels, good blood flow in that circle of Willis, and the bottom group is Alzheimer's disease. Do you realize that Alzheimer's disease is a cardiovascular disease? Your brain has to have oxygen. It likes a lot of it. This is occluding it. Complications of hypertension, obviously listed stroke, heart attack, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, aneurysms, kidney disease, retina, blood pressure, excuse me, blood vessel rupture, and memory. Weakened memory and mental ability. Wait a minute. How is my blood pressure weakening my memory? Your brain, in an attempt to protect itself, does what? Decreases blood flow in your brain. When you decrease and constrict vessels in your brain to reduce the amount of blood flow trying to get in there, what happens to your brain activity? So I'm going to ask you a real simple question. If I'm giving you a drug, that decreases the blood flow to your brain, what am I doing to your brain? Do you realize that blood pressure medication, well, look at this. You'll see the story. Hypertension and intelligence. Results of MRI brain scans of hypertensive and normal subjects. Hypertensive subjects had 10 times more of the white matter lesions. In plain English, scarring in the brain. And the reason you have a scar in brain tissue is because we've had damage. We've, the reason you've got a scar on your hand is because you cut it, right? Same concept. Intelligence tests showed a lower level of overall brain ability and intelligence than those with white matter lesions. So therefore, this white matter lesion, this scarring in the brain, is taking the place of normal brain. Normal brain tissue. And if scars don't think so to speak. Now here's the, here's the hard part. The lesions were present no matter how well the blood pressure had been treated with drug therapy. <laughs> the reason this is so important is because I don't care if your numbers are 110 over 70 taking a medication, you're still going to have a brain problem. You go, well, that's not fair. I'm saying no. It's been a lie that we've believed in medicine for a long time. If I can give you some agent to make you lower your blood pressure and if your numbers look good, then you're good. Sorry folks, there's only one way to treat blood pressure if you wanna keep your brain and it's not with medication. In fact, medication will tend to make you have brain shrinkage. Well, it makes sense. Any, the brain tries to shut down the blood flow 
it will be less active. If you've got a drug that shuts down blood flow, you've got a less active brain. And here's what it looks like. Significantly more brain atrophy occurred in hypertensive patients compared with those with normal blood pressure. There is reasons why we're having so much dementia. There is reasons why we're having so much Alzheimer's disease. There is reason why I'm having a 45-year-old man in my office saying, duh. And I'm going, man, I can't believe this. I didn't write anything in the chart, by the way. But I'm sat there and I went, this is really painful. I'm seeing people, my patients are getting younger. I don't know if you've noticed. Okay. My patients are getting younger than me. So that's, you always compare yourself, right? See, when I first got out of school, I was 26 years old, and I was, everyone was older than me. But somewhere, something happened. And I haven't been asked for a long time, are you old enough to be a doctor? By the way, when I was asked that, I just chose not to say, how do you prove to a person? You want to see my diploma? I mean, what do, you, what do you do? Roll out your piece of paper? No, you just do a good job, and hopefully they respect you for what you do. Back to our slide. The only way to keep a healthy brain is to have normal cardiovascular health, including your blood pressure. That is the only way you keep a healthy brain, not taking a medication to, to lower your blood pressure. They don't work. Same thing. If I give you a statin drug and I lower your bad cholesterol, do I prevent you from having a heart attack? The answer is no. So just because I've got a drug that will drop your LDL cholesterol to 70 and we'll all pat you on the back, you do not have less heart disease deaths from that. See, we've been asking the wrong questions. It's not is, can we lower your lab work? Can we lower your blood pressure? The question is, are you surviving any longer? Are you healthier? Are you dying less frequently? That's the, that's, that's the, the outcome. Well, there's a picture of your artery. That's how complicated an artery is, and that doesn't tell half the story. But I want you to remember a story because this is how amazing it is. Then we need to take a break here. When you go in, no, not you. If you've had a bypass surgery, I want you to tell me something. They take a vessel, either a mammary artery from your chest or some arteries, excuse me, veins from your legs. They do a bypass past the blocked up portion there in the coronary artery. They sew those vessels in place. They take you off the heart-lung machine. They shock your heart and get you going. How many hours do your blood vessels have to heal before they're not supposed to leak, before they're supposed to uh, support blood flow at the pressure? You see, the only reason that we can do things in medicine like that is because you are miraculous. How can you take a vessel sew it together end for end, sew it up in a matter of not even hours, in a matter of minutes, it can hold blood flow. That is an amazing creation. We call it an artery. On the inside here, we have the endothelium. You hear me telling you that blood pressure is not a diagnosis. Blood pressure is a symptom. We got the wording wrong. If you want to know what the diagnosis is, it's called endothelial malfunction. And your endothelium is what lines your arteries, and that is the tissue that puts off hormones and chemicals that regulate whether it expands or contracts. And depending on how irritated and how inflamed it is will determine whether it contracts, lays down cholesterol, is broken and scratched in there and slightly bleeding and along comes cholesterol as a band-aid and folks if you keep putting band-aids on they add up after a while I will admit so the question is what are you going to do to take care of the inside of your vessels we're going to take a look at that in our next session so if you have any questions be glad to answer stand up get the blood flowing get the brain going and We'll see you next session. We've got a, 
a microphone here. Susan would be glad if you have any questions. Otherwise, take a break and uh, we'll go again. Is this making any sense? There's only one way to get healthy, and that's to get healthy, and it's not through drugs. There's not one pharmaceutical that has no side effects. Aspirin has side effects. Apples don't. That's a whole other study they did in England. They actually proved that apples were as effective as their statin drugs. The problem in England is that apples were more expensive than their statin drugs because we pay all the high prices here in America. They're not that slow. Anyway. Okay, please take a break, drink your water, use the facilities if need be, and uh, we will keep going here.